Welcome to For the Record, I'm Rex Hoggard and we're joined by PG of America Pre uh, President Ted Bishop. Ted, thank you so much for joining us. You have had an eventful year and an eventful run as president, but one of the things that stands out from last year of everything that happened was your deafening skills. So we're going to put them to the test right now. Would you join me? Absolutely. <laughs> this is a TV first. Okay. A TV first. We're going to Duffner throughout the entire interview, if you don't mind. <laughs> Right out of the gates. You, I like that. You do your hands have got to be on the hips. It's perfect. And you have to do a little bit of belly. You do. And neither one of us have the bump in the lip, but that's all right. No, we don't. And the you know the other thing is the angle of the head. You know, I noticed when I duffered at, at Oak Hill, I was in far too much of a reclining position. The head needs to be up like this. You might duffner better than duffner does. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, this, of course, was fun. Uh, you're ending your last year as president. Like I said, a very eventful year, but straight out of the gates, what's your legacy going to be as president? You know, I think uh, right now, Rex, the, uh, the one thing that I feel the best about is the relationship that the PGA of America has with the PGA Tour. And, and the reason I say that is I think that over the years, our relationship since 1968 when we split might have been a little bit contentious. And, uh, I, you know, I give all the credit to the commissioner. I mean, I think he... Uh, kind of extended uh, the olive branch early on when uh, I came in as an officer, as, as president. And what we've been able to accomplish uh, to benefit both of our associations over the past year, I think has been really refreshing and it's shown what can happen when people in golf work together versus uh, when we don't. And we certainly, uh, we had a little bit of both last year. Working together was a big theme in 2013. The anchoring debate really came to a head and you were very outspoken. Uh, about the need not to go forward with this uh, uh, with this new rule, was there anything about that that surprised you? Uh, you know, I can't say that there was anything that uh, that really surprised me. I mean, the one thing that you know I would kind of like to use this as an opportunity to explain a little bit is this grandfather period that you know we've asked for, and I think it's important for everybody to understand that when the PGA of America Board of Directors and the PGA Tour Policy Board notified the USGA on July 1 that we would abide by Rule 14-1B in our championships. We also asked them at that point to consider a grandfather period for the recreational amateur. And, you know, it's been unfortunate uh, just due to logistics, I guess, that you know, it's been nine months since we sent that letter and, and Tim and I are going to have the opportunity to go in and talk to them about it on February the 8th. And, I think it's important for people to understand that we're not trying to reinvent the anchoring argument. We're not trying to beat a, a dead horse again. We're just simply following through with the wishes that our two boards expressed. And, uh, and the other thing is we've talked a lot about how the, the rules making procedure is going to change in the future and the PGA of America and the PGA Tour are going to have a greater voice in that. And I think it's, it's important in the spirit of that that we do a very conscientious job with our presentation and, and, and we'd be thorough whatever we think the chances of this grandfather period being adopted would be. You're talking of course the USGA annual meeting that's coming up in a few weeks. You and the Commissioner of course will speak there to try to extend this. Is it your idea that one you're, they're going to be open to this idea and what's your vision on how far out you would like to grandfather it? You know, I, I, I think they're open to it or they wouldn't have given us the audience to begin with, so I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and, and, and say that we're going to go into an open-minded group. Uh, you know, when they uh, implemented the Grooves Rule, they instituted a 15-year grandfather period, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know what the time frame would be. I mean, I think 10 or 15 years would be, would be good, and I think the segment of the population that we're concerned about are older men who, in particular, who have gone to anchoring for a variety of reasons. They've either had the yips or they've got a problem with tremors or, or, or some kind of a physical issue, and it would be nice, uh, be kind of compassionate to be able to see that segment of the population play their careers out and, and not have to worry about making a change or, or, or quit playing the game altogether. That was a key part of your first year as president, and I don't know if this is fair or not, but I would consider you an activist president compared to maybe previous PGA of America presidents. Do you envision that that's maybe the mold going forward? You know, I think that, I would hope that it would be. You know, I would hope that, uh, you know, maybe the PGA of America is in a little bit different place, um, just in terms of the communication and, and uh, uh, really the input I think that we need in, in the golf industry so I would hope that the guys behind me would uh, kind of continue the tradition so to speak. What is your biggest concern or what would be the, the biggest worry 
for future presidents going out five, six, seven years? You know, I think uh, it's, it's, it's the same problem that it was five years ago in terms of the PGA of America and who we serve. And I mean, we all got into this because we had a passion for our members and we want to try to grow the game and, and continue to improve the sport. And I think in order for us to be able to do that, we need to have better engagement by our own members on growth of the game programs and how they're attacking the problem at their facilities. And uh, so that's something that I think it's going to be, uh, we're never going to fix that. We hope to try to continue to improve upon it with each generation of golf professionals that we have. And, and I think that's, you're going to hear a lot of that from me, you know, in this next year. I mean, hopefully uh, some of these other issues are behind us. And from my standpoint, I'll be able to concentrate a little bit more on PGA member issues. Well, starting out 2014, Grow the game has been a buzz. Uh, you and I, or I, attended a, an announcement that you made with Mark King at the PGA Merchandise mm -hmm. Show, which is a very interesting uh, development to try to grow the game called Hack Golf. We need to come up with something that is a golf experience, yeah. something that is 30 minutes, 45 minutes, yeah. 60 minutes, 90 minutes, whatever the consumer has to spend on recreational time. The problem is we don't have a product to give them. And again, this may not sound like a fair question, but we have seen it all. We have seen Golf 2.0 and Golf 2020, Get Golf Ready. How would you grade those initiatives, and how is this one going to be different? You know, I think that, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, connected to a degree. I think the one thing that makes this, this, this thing interesting with Pac Golf is the fact that I truly believe this. Mark King has no agenda. I'm going to announce tonight that we, as a company, are committing up to five million dollars to fund experimentations through this hack golf over the next five years. It's great that TaylorMade is going to subsidize this program to the tune of five million dollars over the next five years. I mean you gotta have financial resources in order for it to be able to succeed but maybe it's a good thing at this point in time that you've got somebody outside of the allied associations to maybe direct this and uh, I, I think the PGA of America has been as guilty as anybody sometimes and we've tried to roll out and, and get buy-in on our own initiatives. Everybody gets a little territorial. People, as there's somewhat, for whatever reason, there's always a little bit of a resistance to maybe support what somebody else is doing because you want to be at the forefront. You want to be recognized as the leader in golf. And I think the refreshing thing about Hack Golf, which is number one, encouraging amateurs and professionals alike to submit ideas on out-of-the-box things that will enhance the enjoyment of the game. And there is going to be a pretty structured decision-making pro uh, process, you know, with Gary Ramey and what Mark is trying to do through Hack Golf that will kind of dissect these ideas, that will departmentalize them, that will put the appropriate groups, you know, in a position where they can filter them down and decide, you know, where they need to go and then try to, if we need financial resources for implementation, try to figure out who the parties are that we need to go to for that. So, I, I, to King's credit, I think, uh, I think he's got a pretty well thought out plan. And, you know, we're kind of at the point in the industry, Rex, where you say, why not? You know, let's try this. It, sure. it, it, it is different, you know, I think, in the context of some of these other things you mentioned. And grow the game seems to be so important. And along those lines, Mark King, the CEO of TaylorMade, during that announcement, made a very interesting statement saying that if you look at the pyramid of influence in golf, you have maybe the PGA Tour and then the USGA and the RNA and then the PGA of America. His contention was is that if we're going to grow the game, it's your organization, the PGA of America, that should be atop that pyramid of influence. Would you agree with that? No, I would totally agree with that. And I think, uh, you know, we as the PGA of America would recognize ourselves as the, what we would say, the tangible connection to those that actually sure. play the game at, at those facilities. and. Uh, you know, as a result of that, I think there's a tremendous responsibility on us to do more than what we've done. And it gets back to this member engagement thing that I talked about earlier, to get our members really more focused on what needs to happen. Beyond the anchored putter debate, uh, beyond Duffnering, uh, one of the things that I think stood out from your first year as president was naming Tom Watson captain. And that seemed like it you kind of broke the paradigm of how you chose captains. Uh, you kind of went back to a captain a little bit older maybe didn't have that connection. Depending on how things go this year at the Ryder Cup in Scotland, can you see that paradigm continue to, to change, continue to shift? I do, I, I do. I think that uh, win or lose the Ryder Cup, I think the naming of Tom Watson was good because we kind of took the age issue out of the equation. I think the, you know, the other one that we have to look at 
going forward, and I don't know at what point we do, that'll be a decision for future PGA officers, but is this thing, does a Ryder Cup captain really need to be somebody that's won a major championship? And if you look at the history of the European Ryder Cup captains, I think you've only had eight that are former major champions. And you look at who's not won a major championship that's been a viable part of those European Ryder Cup teams of, of late, Sergio Garcia, Lee Westwood, Colin Montgomery, Ian Poulter. I mean, those are, in Montgomery's case, he's already been a captain, but those other three guys, even if they don't win a major, I have to think that someday they're gonna be Ryder Cup captains. And so as, you know, as, we, as I put that matrix together and kind of came to the conclusion we had an opening in 14 to do something different with the captainship, and the thing that really stood out to you when you factor in the number of foreign players that have won major championships in the last 15 years, when you look at the number of majors that Tiger and Phil have won, and then you look at major champions that we've had who've never played on a Ryder Cup team, all of a sudden your list of captains based on this unofficial criteria that the PGA of America had, which was you had to win a major championship and you had to play on multiple Ryder Cup teams, that list of players was not very long. And I think the other thing that's really changing, when you look at guys like Davis Love and you look at the fact that they're still actively playing on the PGA Tour when they get into their late 40s, how fair is it to ask those guys at that stage in their career when they're coming into the really the end of their prime earning time on the PGA Tour to take two years out of their professional life and be a Ryder Cup captain? I, th I personally think they're better suited to be Ryder Cup captains when they're in their early 50s. So hopefully there's some, some other changes that might take place that I think will make the whole captainship far better than what it has been. Seems like it's much better. Great first year. Wish you the best of luck in the second year. Thanks. And we just made television history. We did. <laughs> That'll do it for this edition. For the record, we'll see you next time.